بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم We greet you with السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته From my sitting room here in my home in the Caribbean island of Trinidad and uh, our topic is that we are returning once more to the Great War. Events are unfolding rapidly in Russia and in Ukraine that you are all aware of. And so the, those who are saying that this stuff, topic, of, topic of Great War is nonsense, there will be no Great War, they are now receding in the background because everybody is warning now that there is the likelihood of nuclear war. The President of the United States has done it. The, the President of Russia has warned about it. The Pope has warned about it. The Secretary General of the United Nations has done about it. And so many others have been warning, yes, we are on the doorstep of a great war. And our Prophet has prophesied it, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. The Malhamah, he called it, in which 99% of those who fight in that war would be killed. Yes, so therefore it cannot be conventional warfare. If our prophet prophesied 99% of combatants being killed, it has to be a weapon, a war using weapons of mass destruction. Now then, I have spoken on this subject again and again, but I want to bring it into a capsule today. What is the first step we must take to prepare for nuclear war? Answer. They will not give you the answer because they don't talk about nuclear war. No. And if they do, they're supporting NATO. That's what these traitors do. And they call themselves Islamic scholars. I am denouncing them so that you will know who they are. The first thing that you have to do as a believer in the one God a believer in the one God. To prepare for nuclear war is to banish the fear of death from your heart. I cannot ask you to do something that I'm not doing myself. And so I say to you, truthfully and honestly, I don't have any fear in my heart at all about death. No. And I never had any fear when you had your COVID um, uh, circus, the COVID circus and the, and the three, three feet sp social distances and your face mask and all that circus. I never had any fear in my heart at all these last two years. If you have faith in your heart, then you will not have the fear of death in your heart. If you are afraid to die and you're searching for a place where you could hide in a nuclear war, you don't have faith in your heart, my brother. You don't have faith in your heart, my sister. So that's my first advice. Banish fear of death from your heart. Is there anyone telling you that? The second way to prepare as People who follow Prophet Muhammad the Christian will give you a different answer, the Hindu, the Buddhist. I'm talking for those who are Muslims. The second step in preparation for the Great War is to seek protection from the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Isra, I wish I had a screen so I could put the verse on the screen, the Arabic. I don't translate the Quran, but I'll give you the explanation. And when you recite the Quran, meaning as Allah recited it, not the way that Darul Ulum asked you to recite it, no, the way Allah recited it. When you recite the Quran as Allah recited it, and as He ordered our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to recite it, He says, Quran. 
And when I have recited the Quran, O Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa you must also follow that way of recitation, Surah Al Qiyamah. So the second step is to recite the Quran the way Allah recited. Wa iza karatta al Quran, jalla bayna ka wa bayna ladina la yu'minu na bil akhirati hijaban mastura. This world which is waging war on Russia. This Western world is a godless world. It's a godless world. They don't believe in the hereafter. And Allah said, if you recite the Quran, we will protect you, be put between you and that godless world who does not believe in the hereafter. We will place a hijab which will cover you. What more do you want? When will you start reciting the Quran? How many years now I've been asking you to recite the Quran? MashaAllah! I get so many emails from different parts of the world. Sheikh, I am reciting the Quran the way you taught us in your book, The Quran and the Moon. And I complete the whole Quran every month with the correct adza. And Sheikh, it has changed my life. I'm getting the emails all the time. So when will you wake up? There are those of you who are close to me. And I love you. And yet you will not recite the Quran. What more can I do? When Allah calls me away, I warn you, don't ever say that you are my student. No. You, you bury me. You make a dua for me and get back on the battlefield. I don't want people praising me. You are my student only if you are reciting the Quran every day. The best time is in the morning and you are completing the recitation of the whole Quran every lunar month. And this is the second way to prepare yourself for the great war. The third preparation for the great war is you better find a good guide to guide you. There are bogus scholars out there, bogus, who use, who gives you a version of Islam that the Western world doesn't feel any threat at all. It's like a Sunday lunch for them, that version of Islam that comes from these scholars. But if you follow the version of Islam that comes from someone who follows Khidr alayhi salam, someone who turns to the Quran to guide and to guide and to teach the people the reality of the world today, the Western world will hate you and despise you. So look for a scholar of integrity Look for a scholar who can throw light on the world today. Look for a scholar who can tell you the great war is coming. Look for a scholar who can help you to prepare for that great war. Don't look for these fellows who are like marshmallows who sing for their supper and they close the doors of their masjid on me. The fourth, the third, the fourth one, preparation for the great war is you must stock up on blankets, on warm clothing, on food which is non-perishable, like sand food, stock up on water, stock up on firewood. I am stocking up on firewood. Stock up on lighters to light a fire. Uh, I have spoken a lot about this. And you will be able to get more security in the remote countryside than in the city where there will be anarchy when there is no electricity, there is no running water, there is no supply of food. People will be fighting each other dog eat dog in the cities and breaking down your home, your doors of your home if they suspect you have food. So get out of the cities please and go to the remote countryside as I am myself doing. That's why I'm building that small home. It's just a hundred yards away from the beach. Lo, the remote countryside of Trinidad and I can get fish to eat. Now then, the last uh, thing I want to say is to direct attention. If no nuclear war takes place, who are those 
who are most vulnerable? And the answer, it's women and children who have no husband, no father, no man around them to protect them. So in the same way that I've always advised when we have a large gathering, if any event takes place that causes panic, every single man who is present must now become the protector of every woman who is present. No man must seek to escape. No. If we have to die, we die. But we must protect our women and children who are present. That is the way of Islam. So in the same way that you don't rush to the door, trampling over people to escape if a fire is taking place. No, every single man in that gathering will go and shake, take care and protect the woman and the children. That is Islam. We are a different way of people. And so in preparing for the great war, we must think about our sisters who are living alone. They're single. They have no husbands. They either never married or they divorced. Some of them have children and they're living alone. What can we do for them? If you have the means to marry, then you should offer to marry them. And if your wife says, if you take a second wife, I'll leave you. Well, then let her go. Let her go. You never, you never knew you had that kind of wife. Now you know it. The truth comes first, not your love for your wife. Loyalty to Allah comes first, not loyalty to your wife. Not loyalty to your children, loyalty to the truth. And the need of the hour today is if, the, if you have the means to marry, then marry. If you have to ma marry, then remember you have to treat them with equity with your wife. And Allah says, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ اللَّهَ تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدًا if you fear that you cannot marry them and treat them equally with your wives, economically equally, then stay with one, one wife. And then you can take them if they offer themselves as milk al yameen. But there is no mufti today talking about milk al yameen because they all say this is a slave woman and there is no slavery today. So that's the end of that chapter. Next topic, Next topic please. That's how they dismiss the subject. But if you have a medical yameen and you're taking care of her and you're pro providing food and clothing and shelter and protection for her, mashallah, what a thing. A house for you in Jannah. But if you have sexual relations with her, then you run the risk that they will say, they will say you're committing zina. So I have suggested if you fear that, then you must make a nik nikah with her. Then what else can we do for our sisters? This is the most important part here. If you can bring a number of such women together and those who have children and put them in a big house or in a complex where they can live together and support each other and they might be able to even meet some means of livelihood but you are doing it. You are providing for them if you have the means. The, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ lived in huts. They were comfortable living in huts. So if you can do that and you bring a number of women, they're not your wives, they're not your milkal yameen, but you are bringing them together and providing them with the security of living together rather than living alone and ensuring they have a place to sleep ensuring they have food to eat, and most of all, they are protected. This is the last thing I want to speak about, that the, these women also, in the chaos which has followed the Great War, remember what happened in, in Syria, the amount of zina taking place, eh? the, the slavery, enslavement of women in Syria, and they call that Salafi Islam. Hmm? So these women will be even more vulnerable to sexual attacks when the Great War takes place. And remember what happens when you commit zina. I have said it many times. Dajjal wants to encourage zina because when you commit zina, 
which is adultery and fornication, sexual relations, meaning sexual intercourse, without the legal framework of marriage, or medically, I mean. Then what happens is that all the noor in your heart is gone, and you are inside, you have only darkness. And when you have only darkness inside, you can't understand the child. Every, da every tune that the child plays, you will dance to it the way they dance <laughs> three feet apart in Salat. <laughs> all, all of these mas massages, they were praying three feet apart and with their face mask. <laughs> like the child's tune, they were dancing to it. Deaf, dumb, and blind. But if you have no in your heart, you won't do that. I never perform my Salat in any Jamaat with people standing three feet apart. Never did it. And I never perform my Salat with a face mask. Never. Did. No, I prefer to pray at home than to go and join that circus. So, if you are able to bring these women together, and provide them with some security and provide them with a the means whereby they have food to eat, they have clothing, and they live together to keep the company each other. These women will be safe from that zina out there. Think about our sisters. Think about the sexual predatory who is going to attack them when the Great War takes place. They'll be vulnerable. Think about their vulnerability, our sisters and their children, and act now before the great war takes place if Allah gives you the means to protect our sisters. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.